Please be seated. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Words that many of us pray every day and don't usually in the midst of the Lord's Prayer stop long enough to really consider what it is that we're saying or what it means for us. Until perhaps a moment like today arrives when we hear in the Gospel Jesus' extended explanation of those little verses in the Lord's Prayer and what exactly that might mean, which causes us to pay a little more attention to what it is that we pray all the time and what exactly forgiveness looks like and how it relates to God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others. This summer we had our summer book club and we read three different books. One of them was entitled 70 Times 7, which comes from this gospel we heard today. It's a book that recounts the story, true story, of the murder of Ruth Helpe, a grandmotherly Sunday school teacher in Gary, Indiana, uh, who was murdered by a group of teenage girls. Uh, they knew that Ruth was generous and loving and would sometimes invite neighborhood kids into her home. Uh, they took advantage of that in an attempt to rob her, and while they were robbing her, they took her life in a terrible, terrible way. Uh, the girl most responsible for her death was Paula Cooper, who soon found herself convicted of murder uh, and, at the age of 16, sitting on death row. Uh, that was in the days when that was still possible. It's not anymore. We didn't used to bat an eye at 10th graders being sentenced to death, but somewhere along the way we realized maybe we don't want to have that as a possibility in our culture. The reason for the book, however, was that was not the end of the story. Um, things took an unexpected twist for folks who knew the situation when Ruth Pelkey's grandson, Bill, had a very clear vision of his grandmother who came to him one night at work and told him that he needed to forgive Paula. And he wasn't quite sure what was happening, but he knew it was serious and that it was true, that that's what his grandmother would in fact want, and that's what his faith called for. And so he worked towards forgiveness of this girl who had taken his beloved grandmother's life. He wrote to her in prison. Uh, she was reluctant to communicate back, but finally they began a correspondence and a friendship, and he was able to convey to her that he had forgiven her, that he thought his grandmother would have forgiven her, and that he wanted to do everything he could to get her off of death row. And so he joined a group that worked for that effort. They had the support of lots of people around the world, including the Pope, for Paula Cooper's case. They were successful in changing the law in Indiana, and that was one of the changes in the movement that led the Supreme Court to change the law for the United States around the death penalty itself. And Bill Pelkey didn't do all this without any cost. Uh, it was a big part of the end of his marriage, seeking forgiveness and mercy for this murderer. Uh, it cost him family relationships, uh, and even friendships as he pursued this, but it became his life's work even after Paula uh, was released from prison at one point, after decades in jail. He continued to uh, rally for the elimination of the death penalty in many circumstances. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Another story that always comes to mind for me when we talk about forgiveness in unexpected places is 2006 in my hometown of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where a milk truck driver who picked up uh, milk from dairies and took it to the plant to be cleaned up and sold, barricaded himself in an Amish school and killed five Amish school children, severely wounded five more before he took his own life. Goodness. Before the sun went down that night, uh, members of the Amish community were with his widow, comforting her. They visited his parents to comfort them and his in-laws to comfort them. There were more Amish people at his funeral than non-Amish. And they started a fund for his children, knowing that they would suffer without their father's yes. income. And that kind of forgiveness got the attention of the world because it's uncommon not just to forgive, but to forgive in such a loving and wholehearted way as that community spoke to the world about forgiveness. It also turned out in time that unforgiveness was a part of that story. Uh, the man who did those terrible things was a very troubled individual, obviously, as we would imagine, suffered from some mental illness, 
but part of the mix that had created such a toxic person was that his own daughter had been um, died uh, just after birth nine years previously, and he had written in his journals about his inability to forgive God for that. And that toxic anger just did some terrible things as it mutated in his life and his inner being. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I've chosen two examples that are on the extreme end of the spectrum. I don't know that there's much more someone could do to us than to take the life of a loved one, but I suspect that everyone here understands moments where forgiveness might be considered. Because we've all been hurt, some of us have been abused, some of us have had things stolen from us, whatever it may be, there's moments where we found ourselves in a position to make a choice about whether or not we would forgive another. No doubt many of us, if not all of us here, understand the other side of forgiveness because we have been the one who has hurt, or we have been the one who abused, or we have been the one who stole, and who are offered forgiveness or a second chance or some kind of retribution in our lives, and so we know it from that side as well. Regardless of our experience of needing, offering, or receiving forgiveness, we know it's not easy. C.S. Lewis said that forgiveness is a splendid idea until you have to forgive somebody. And then it's different, isn't it? We know this for sure. We know that it's not the norm for us to immediately move into a place of forgiveness. It is counter to what seems to be intuitively natural for us as human beings, which is why Jesus' teaching stands out in examples like the first two that I gave stand out, because it's not the norm, is it? And it's definitely not easy for us either. Today's teaching comes as a continuation of what we heard last Sunday. Jesus is talking to his disciples about life and community, which prompts Peter's question. Last week it was, if somebody in the community has done wrong, you go to them openly and honestly and tell them they're wrong. If they don't listen, you take another. If they still don't listen, you bring it out to the whole church. If they still don't listen, then you can make them like a tax collector, make them an outsider. There are consequences to their failure to reconcile with the person and the church from which they come. Which tells us that forgiveness is not independent of holding people accountable. It is not that by forgiving someone, they don't have to make amends for what they've done, either in our life or in the court system or wherever else. It can get very complicated to see how justice and forgiveness rest alongside each other, but they do. And so forgiveness does not mean you are letting somebody off the hook, so to speak. Um, forgiveness also doesn't mean that you have to forget. I don't think it says, unless I missed it in the gospel, forgive and forget, just to forgive. It's probably a pretty good idea to keep in mind the people in our lives who might be able to cause us harm or might put us in jeopardy, which is not the same thing as failing to forgive them. They are two separate realities. Forgiveness doesn't really live on a ledger. It doesn't really live in a courtroom. It lives in people's hearts. It's a spiritual orientation. Forgiveness is the act of letting go of the burdens that are placed on our hearts when we have been wronged, when we have been hurt, so that we don't carry around anger or resentment or a desire for retribution and revenge, because all of those things, if we don't deal with them, will poison our soul and strip us of the freeness of life that is the intent of all of God's children. Forgiveness, if it is not offered, um, can be very detrimental to our well-being. That alone still does not make it easy to offer. But we also find the same is true is of the heart when it was <laughs> receiving end of forgiveness as well. If you've been forgiven by somebody, you know that the burden of guilt and uh, the worry that you have harmed someone, especially someone that you love, can be terrible. And when somebody lifts that from you, that too is healing and freedom in a way that can be life-changing if we let it be. And there's plenty of stories of people who, upon being forgiven, change their life entirely and see the world in a whole new light. It is a matter of the heart like the teaching about community and holding people accountable, as we talked about last week, being grounded in love, so too is Jesus' teaching on 
forgiveness. As Mother Teresa said, if you really want to understand love, understand forgiveness first. And then you'll know what love really is. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It tells us in the Lord's Prayer every time we pray it, as Jesus does in this gospel, that somehow, some way, our ability to forgive people is connected to God's forgiveness of us. It may not be conditional, as it sounds to some ears like it is in the gospel this morning. That's what makes this a very hard teaching. If we want to take Jesus' parable all the way to the end and who God is in the parable, it might seem like it is conditional. If you don't forgive, then you pay the ultimate price yourself. I, for one, hope that God's grace is bigger than that. And I hope that this is one of those hyperbolic teaching moments of Jesus where he gives the extreme example to get our attention to say, this is really important, so listen to what I'm telling you. You need to forgive. And the answer to Peter's question is not a numerical answer. It's not one that we're mathematically ever going to be able to fulfill. It's not seven times. It's not 77 times, as our translation says, or 70 times seven, which would be 490, as it is sometimes translated. This is the equivalent of Jesus saying, so many times that you can't even count it. Don't even try. This is to be the orientation of our inner being, our hearts, our way of interacting with each other. To be a people of forgiveness, to enter into a situation with that on the table, even if we can't get there right away. It's part of what we are to pursue. It's the goal that we seek to reach in our relationships with others, as hard as it may be. This parable that Jesus teaches, the answer he gives Jesus, all of it is meant to tell us just how outsized this relationship is between the one who forgives and the one who needs forgiveness. And not just his answer about how many times. The story about the slave who had the debt. We don't understand the numbers and biblical language that we're talking about, but liken it to billions of dollars of debt that gets wiped away. That's one of the reasons for pity, because the king knew that even if he sold this man and his entire family to slavery, it would never begin to touch the debt that he now had to absorb. The second, smaller debt, is still a pretty good-sized number. It might be today twenty, thirty, even $40,000 that this man was owed by another when he failed to give him the mercy he had already received. But the point is, we don't do it because it's equitable. We do it because that's what mercy looks like. That's what forgiveness looks like. And the truth of what this parable tells us is that God's forgiveness is like that. It is immeasurable. You can't count the number of times that God offers forgiveness to God's children. I can't. Thank goodness, and I'm glad that we don't Expect to find a card file like in the movie Bruce Almighty when we get to heaven that shows us all those times that forgiveness was ours. I'm just grateful that it is and for the mercy and goodness of God. Hopefully it will be uh, an inspiration for me and for all of us to continue to forgive others. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sometimes the forgiveness the need to give it, and the need to receive it never leaves us. Sometimes the burdens that we carry are things that we have done to our, uh, ourselves, things we have done that we shouldn't have done, that we continue to beat ourselves up about, and we have to learn to forgive ourselves sometimes. It's a little different dynamic to be the one who has to offer and to receive one's own forgiveness, but anybody in recovery knows what that's like. I recently heard Robert Downey Jr., who is... This was over a decade ago, talking about his own recovery when he first learned about the need to stop hugging the cactus, as it's called. <laughs> to stop continuing to poke himself full of holes over the wrongs he had done and the things he had done. Instead, just to deal with them once and for all, to pull out the little uh, stickers, as painful as it is, to make amends with others and with himself, and then get on with his life. And that's the dynamic of forgiveness for all involved. It's not easy. It can be actually quite painful, but it allows us to move on. The other element we can't lose about forgiveness is sometimes the person that we are going to forgive will never know that we've forgiven them. There's some people it's probably unsafe for us to go to and say, I forgive you for what you did to me. 
I've counseled more than enough people about forgiving people who have already left this world and reside with God, who we can never reconcile with on this side of heaven, but we can still offer forgiveness because of what it frees up in us. Because when we don't, the people who have hurt us, whether it's us or someone else, they continue to hold some power over us. They continue to hurt us if we can't let go of it. And the only way to freedom is forgiveness. I don't think it's conditional for God, but it's important to God. It's why I made the short list of things that Jesus said we should pray about. And we do. We're going to pray about it at this altar where we also remember forgiveness that pours out as freely as wine into a chalice that we get to drink from. Remembering that God has always been about forgiveness above all else. That the only reason we celebrate Jesus coming, the only reason Jesus came, was to bring reconciliation to God's people. To bring forgiveness for all the ways that threaten to separate us from God. That is the core of the story that we're here to remember and the faith that we celebrate. So as you pray the Lord's Prayer, as you go through life and through relationships, through hurt and pain, either because you cause it or because you receive it from others, as we pray through the Lord's Prayer every day, for those of us who do it at the altar when we pray during the communion prayer, maybe the words will catch just a little bit for us. As we think about where we might offer someone forgiveness, who we might need forgiveness from, about God's great love for us and mercy, and the thanksgiving that hopefully comes with that. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us.